I, you know, it's fun to get to be together, but I love stratifying a little bit because I can see more of your pretty smiling faces. This also means, um, by way of coaching, that everything that you respond to, you're going to have to like double your emphasis on your responsiveness. So if I say something meaningful, then I need you to think, oh, yes, like, like twice as loud and twice as often. Can you do that for me? <laughs> you just did. <laughs> oh, this is good. All right. I... I feel good. Hey, it is good to be together here. Um, this might come as a shocker, but here in two days, I am going to turn 40. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, it's fun. You guys have a lot of opinions. I didn't think that was going to be uh, as interactive. As it was. But here's what I don't get as much as I used to get. I used to get when I tell people my age, they're like, R really? <laughs> you look so young. And, and now when I tell people my age, they're like, yeah, it seems about right. Yeah, it's, yeah, maybe a little, you know, I just, I'm, I'm getting older and I'm, I'm embracing that. And a part of embracing that was actually a celebration that I had with some buddies of mine. Uh, there are a few guys that I have literally grown up with. For decades, we've known each other, over 20 years. And to celebrate all of us turning 40, we decided about a month ago to head over to the mountains and goof off and catch up and make new memories, tell stories, and, uh, and, and look back on these lives that we got to enjoy together. And it's been interesting because as we look back, we got to think about and remember a lot of the big milestones that we've walked through and navigated together, almost all of the biggest ones. You know, it, it began with us talking about when we got our first girlfriends our freshman year of high school, you know, and then later on we fell in love and then we all got dumped and, you know, we got to care for each other during that season. We went on to University of Tennessee together and got to move from our homes into dorms. Any UT fans out there, by the way, someone wanted, okay, just, just make it and no, and the rest aren't. Okay. That was a, uh, okay. Um, so we went to UT together and, uh, and enjoyed that, moved out, learned how to like, like grow up and get an apartment and what does that look like and pay bills. Uh, we got engaged, you know, at different times together in that same seasons, got married, started having kids, got houses. I mean, we, we have been through it all together. And it's interesting, as we descended down the mountain, I had this thought, and it's this. You know, I am who I am because of who these guys are. I'm literally, I have been shaped by these men and for the better. And I bet you can think of someone in your life right now or a couple people in your life that as you look back on your story, on your journey, on the milestones that you've uh, crossed and traversed together, you can think of a person or a few people that have shaped who you are and who you have had the privilege of shaping as well. And it's interesting how profound the other people who are in our lives actually shape who we were going to become. This isn't uh, new information, though. Apparently there was a psychologist from Harvard that did some research on relationships, on how do other people impact who we are. And here's what he found. Dr. David McClellan found that 95% of our successes and our failures are connected to the people that are around us. Up to 95%. Now, this isn't shocking. You guys aren't like, wow, that's, that's new. We know this because when we were growing up, our mamas cared a lot about the people who we had around us, didn't they? And when we had people around us that they didn't like, they were quick to express those. That, you don't need to be hanging out with him. Mm -mm, all tatted up and pierced. You need to find yourself some good Jesus-loving friends, right? Like, we've heard this. And this even goes back to the wisest man in history who spoke to this in Proverbs. Listen to what Solomon said about our relationships and the people that are around us and how it helps shape who we are. He said this in Proverbs 13, 20. And this is a verse we're going to say a few times here together. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. I'm going to say that again, but I want us to say this together. You guys with me? So whoever walks with the wise becomes, but a companion of fools will suffer. 
So there it is. We literally become those who we surround ourselves with. And I had this thought, and, and it's this, it's a question. Who are you becoming? Now that's a big question. It's kind of an obtuse question. But as you look at your life and who you are now, or as you look ahead to where you're headed, who, who are you becoming? Is it who you thought you'd be right now? Is it where you thought you'd be? As you look ahead and you think about when you grow up, who you actually hope to be, what is that? Do you wonder? What do you think God hopes you're going to become? What do you think your wife or your kids or your husband or your friends or your boss hope one day you become? Who do you want to be? Well, I think there's some... Wisdom in this proverb, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. There's something about the people around us that will shape who we are, and it goes even deeper. It's actually hardwired into our DNA that those relationships are going to dictate and determine who we are because at the core of our being, we were created to thrive in the midst of healthy relationships. In the midst of healthy community, we will be at our best when there are people around us who are inviting us and shaping us into becoming who God longs for us to be. And John said it earlier, and this is one of our core values that here at Tuvers, we do life together. So here's what we're going to be doing over the next couple of months. We're going to be unpacking that. What does it look like really to do life together? How does that look? I know that sounds maybe even a little cliche, and maybe you're wondering, like, yeah, that sounds good, but how do I put that into practice? And let me tell you this. As we think about this community, this family that God is building us into, we aren't looking just to be big. We know that we're called to be a family. And as a family, God has some distinctives that he is whispering into us who he wants us to be based on who he is. You know, one of the perks of not having a building Yet. Uh, and anyway, no, because we don't have a building, when someone asks you about our church, you can't point to, oh, yeah, it meets over, it's, it's right over there. It's that building. It's real pretty. It's got the whatever. We don't really have that. This is a school. This isn't even ours. We borrow it for one day out of the week, which is really healthy and helpful because the church and our church isn't a building. It's a people. And it was always designed to be a people. That Greek word, ecclesia, where the church first found its way into Christianity, this was those people who were so committed to God and Jesus and who he was that they were actually changed and transformed in such radical ways that as people looked at these many Christ Christians, that they saw, wow, he, they're like Jesus. And as we gather together, and as God calls us to look at him and to connect to one another, we are set apart for his purposes. But before we ever think about building some building, we need to fully understand and grip who it is that God has called us to be. And by the way, that's way more important than where we meet. So who are you? How and why has God set us apart? What makes us distinct? And the first distinct is that we see that God does in the very beginning is he takes us and he places us into families. And the reason he did this is because we are created and are by our very nature relational. If you've got your Bibles, flip them on over to the very book, first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. And we'll see at the creation account how God created us in his image. It's the familiar story of Adam and Eve, chapter 1, verse 26, we read this, and we can come up with the house lights just a hair so that you guys can actually read your Bibles if you have them. I see people doing this, so you can see those. That'd be great, honey. Thank you. So Genesis 1, 26, we read this. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So we see from the dust of the earth, God, he grabs some dust and he begins to create. Man, this is the very first human. You know his name. What is it? Adam. He makes Adam. And almost immediately, he looks at Adam and he sees that he's got 10 fingers. He's got 10 toes. But for some reason, he's incomplete. There's something missing. And as we scroll down to chapter 2, verse 18, 
the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. And I will make a helper fit for him. So God looks at the canvas of what he's just created and he says, not, not good. I'm not done yet. Incomplete. In other words, life alone, life in isolation, it's not at its best. It's not how God created us. And by the way, when God says something's not good, we need to listen to these things, right? We should be leaning in at this point. I think Jerry Maguire was on to something. You remember the 90s, what, what he said to Renee Zellweger's character when they were in the elevator or at the house or wherever they were. He said what? Oh, I'm too old. You don't know that, <laughs> Do you? A lot of you are like, what? What did he say? I don't know. Who has seen Jerry Maguire in here? Okay, why didn't you jump in, everybody? <laughs> he said, what? You complete me. And it was beautiful. It was one of those famous lines in any movie back in the 90s. And something resonated with the culture then, maybe far deeper than we even knew at the time, even though this was hokey and cheesy, and even in this context, like, no, not, not really, we've got God. And, but, and yet there's something deep in our DNA that says, yeah, there's something right about that. that. That somehow that God has given us one another to bring about a greater level of completeness and wholeness. And that's because of this. We were created by God for community. That's how he made us. And theologically, we can know that because back in Genesis 126, we see that God made us in his image, but that's the plural word for God, Elohim. So that's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it's this mysterious thing where we don't really understand it, but we know that God existed in perfect relationship with himself. And so if we're going to reflect him well, then we need to exist and we will thrive in the midst of community and the midst of relationship as well. And out of the communion of the creation, we begin to see that life and vibrancy and relationship spills out onto the canvas of creation. It just happens. And this is where we begin to experience the things that we know we need and that we so long for. And perhaps that's why you're even here this morning. We hunger for belonging. We want a place to feel like we're a part of a family. We know that there's something that we have that God has given us to give away. We're, we've got a purpose that transcends just kind of us getting our stuff done where we can experience a level of relationship that when Jesus is at the center, it's, there's no comparison. And there's something in us that craves that, that longs for that. And as we look at humanity throughout history and across the globe, we see this, is that we have this propensity to cluster into communities. We do this, right? You see this at work where there are a few people that you connect with a little bit more than others. We do this in churches where you begin to see that you've connected and growing closer to some rather than others. We did this back in high school and middle school, you know, they called these cliques. You remember these? Where there were these groups of people that were based on interest or passion, like athletes, like they kind of hung out with other athletes and uh, other jocks. There were drama kids. They were a little bit more theatrical and they hung out with drama kids. There were nerds, you know, who hung out with other nerds and now they're rich and we're all working for them. <laughs> so things really worked out for them later on uh, in life. And we saw, you know, goody two shoes and we saw peace, love and grateful dead fans and we saw rebels, but they all, we all began to sort of cluster and find their tribe and find their people. And that's because of this. We were hardwired to seek and to find and to thrive in the midst of community, in the midst of these relationships. So this is the why behind that hunger and that longing that every one of us has. So, so then what does this look like in, in real life? Because some of you, are, you're hearing this and you're, you're like, yes and amen. I just, I love people and I love relationships. And I was actually born in a small group. Um, I started a Bible study in the NICU and we're going to be buried together in a group coffin because life is meant to be done together and it's going to end it. You know, like you, you know this, you bleed it, right? This is just who you are. I don't have to convince you of these things. And yet there are others of us and, and I would guess we could all tell a story where we gave community a shot or we tried it, you know, 
And, and maybe for good reasons, maybe we moved and we had this incredible experience there and then. And, and maybe here we are and we're just like, I don't know where to start and I'm kind of tired and I don't know if it could be like it was once or then. Or maybe you found yourself giving community a shot, you took a risk and then you begin to build friendships and relationships with other people and then you got hurt because we always get hurt because we're broken and sinful and we hurt others because we're broken and sinful and yeah, you recoiled and you said, no, nah, I don't know, I don't know if I want to do that, I don't know if I want to lean in again. It's too hard, it's too costly. Or maybe you just drifted for no good reason. Maybe you started working night shift and you just didn't have the capacity. You started having kids and you just were tired or this, that, or the other. And then you found yourself withdrawn just because your calendar got filled up and you just didn't have the time that you once had. And so when you hear this, it's hard. And you don't know where you're going to squeeze it in because you're already spread way too thin. Or maybe, just maybe you're new to this whole concept of really doing life together. Not just talking about it, but, but really knowing people in deeper ways and being known. Inviting others in in ways that might make you a little uncomfortable. But you know, that's where the good stuff is. Now here's what we know, no matter what. However your past experiences were or whatever your current convictions are, deep down you know that life is meant to be done together. You know that in isolation you have probably, like I, made your worst mistakes. You've had your hardest experiences. You've felt most isolated and vulnerable. And God's word actually validates this. We see Proverbs 18.1 Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. So as we think about what it means to do life together here at Two Rivers Church, let me tell you, our desire, our hope, our prayer, our belief is that we are going to thrive when we are connected to, we are, we are deeply anchored by the Word of God first. Because the Word of God doesn't change even though we do. Isn't that good news? So the more we get to know God through his word, the more we're going to be changed by it. The promise of God's word is that it will not return void. And so we are a people who are under the authority of God's word. And that's telling us not only who God is, but also who we are and who he designed us to be. But not only are we going to be anchored to the word of God, but we're to be tethered to the people of God. Because we're going to drift. We all do. And as we begin to drift... We can only drift so far, right? As we begin to believe things that maybe aren't true, but we need God's word to confront and to remind us of what is true. We had some neighbors over on Friday night, and uh, he's gone through a lot of hard things, lost his dad, lost his brother. And uh, as he was sharing his story a little bit more, he, he said, man, I'm going to be honest, I started believing some crazy stuff. And he said, but, you know, then I, had a, I actually had a friend who sent me this scripture. That was all he sent me, but just he sent me this. And it reminded me, yes, that's right. That is true. But God also created us to be connected not only to his word, but also to his people. So that you and I, if and when we drift, we've got someone that has the courage to go say, hey, how you doing? What's going on? So you, you feel distant or or just checking in or encouraging or loving or cheering us on and this is our hope and i know for us men in particular let me speak to us this is a little bit a little bit more challenging like the idea of us actually needing someone else it's a difficult one to admit isn't it men we like being independent we like being autonomous we like feeling like we don't need anyone we don't we are fine by ourselves and no you know and it's not true is it it's interesting the statistics of men uh, over half of all men admit that they don't have a single friend not one friend and i get it you know we guys you a lot of us, you get married, you know, like you turn your attention to your wife, and then you get jobs, and you start having kids, and then it's about responsibilities, and then we kind of leave behind those seasons of relationships and friends, and yet we can feel in our soul something's, something's still missing. There's this faint whisper, whether you're a man or a woman, that there's got to be more to life. 
There's got to be more to, to community than just surface relationships. And that's because we were created for something deeper. We were created for community. In the New Testament, we see that there are 54 one another's alone. We see to love one another as God's family, to be gracious to one another, to show kindness, to forgive, and my favorite, outdo one another in showing honor. This is a key verse from the men's ministry, but the women's ministry has a key verse too, and it's Psalm 34, 3. It says, O oh, magnify the Lord with me. So you see that togetherness, and let us exalt his name, what? Let us exalt, let's just say that also together. Let us exalt his name, what? Together. So God has given us one another. We need one another. The truth is, is that you have something that I need and I don't have. And I have something that you need and you don't have. And when we begin to sit in closer circles, we we'll remove past the surface and we see what our needs are and we see what God has given us and we begin to deposit and withdraw. You see, this is how God created us to live, life together. And if you're still unconvinced, here's what I want to do this morning. I want to, I want to do just a, a little survey of what we see as a bit of a case study in the Old Testament of a familiar character. His name is David. And we see what can happen when we live in isolation versus in community. We see what can happen when we surround ourselves with fools versus people who are wise. And it's in David's story. If, you, if you've if you been around church, you know that David was the shepherd boy who eventually became a king. He slayed that massive giant. And there was a defining moment in David's life that I actually believe was the game changer for him. That would determine whether or not he eventually became the guy that we know and we still talk about who wrote all these beautiful psalms. The guy who was described as a man after God's own heart. That David, that David that we know. I think there was a moment back in his story that we're going to pick up on and to see it could have gone either way. He could have chosen isolation and to stay in that route, or he could have leaned into relationship. When we pick up on his story, he's about 50 years old. He's been a king for about 20 years, and this is in 2 Samuel chapter 11. If you want to know where 2 Samuel is, it's immediately after 1 Samuel, right there in your Old Testament. You can just, <laughs> I'm getting older, those jokes are funnier to me now, and they're not to you, and that's okay. Starting out in verse 2, 2 Samuel chapter 11, we read this. And it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and he was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and he inquired about the woman. And one said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and he took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her. Now, to understand this more fully, we need to know who Uriah was. Uriah was in a group of elite military men. They were called the Mighty Men. And these guys were by David's side. They actually helped him come from this shepherd boy into this king, and they helped David defend Israel against its attackers, and they fought with him. And David is taking an evening stroll after I'm sure, a wonderful dinner, and he sees from afar on another rooftop a beautiful woman. And that Hebrew word for to see, it's ra'ah. Let's learn some Hebrew together, ra'ah. Ra'ah, you're now a Hebrew scholar. And that word means to look or gaze intently. So David is creeping pretty seriously on, on this woman who's bathing. And of course, at this point, he he, he's got a decision to make. He's like, can I, do I proceed? Do I keep on or do I not? So he goes, he sends one of his people to find out what's the situation with this woman who's bathing. He discovers her name is Bathsheba. He discovers that she's a married woman. Now that doesn't slow him down. It doesn't stop him. He doesn't relent. So he continues and he says, go get her and bring her back, which is exactly what his servant does. And despite what David clearly knew to be wrong, these desires of his body overcame and shut down his brain. And you may know the story eventually to discover that Bathsheba got pregnant and he's the father. And so at this point, David does what, what so often we do when we blow it and we're potentially going to get in trouble. He goes into damage control. <laughs> he's like, okay, I've crossed the line. This is irrevocable. 
what can I do? So he begins to scheme, and he's got these different scenarios that he's going to begin to attempt to undo the damage that he has done already. Look down at chapter 11, verse 6. So David sent word to Joab, this is one of his captains, send me Uriah the Hittite. So he sends him back from battle, he comes back home, and he's got this first plan. Plan A is this. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get Uriah the Hittite, and I'm going to get Bathsheba in my palace, and I'm going to set up a little situation. We'll put on some Marvin Gaye, you know, set some bubbly out, and, and let the husband and wife do what husband and wife will hopefully do. And that will mask my sin, and I'm going to be okay. Well, as we read on, this plan ultimately fails, because Uriah is a man of honor. And he knows that his men are out fighting, and he would not dishonor them by sleeping with his wife. So he ends up sleeping outside of the palace. Plan A fails. Now David could relent at this point, but he doesn't. He goes to plan B. So then what he does is he gets Uriah and he gets Bathsheba and he's like, well, maybe if I get Uriah intoxicated, that will loosen his judgment and then maybe he'll make a decision that will accommodate what I need to happen here so that I can move on and they can move on and we can all live happily ever after. So that's exactly what he schemes and exactly what he does, except the second time Uriah, being a man of honor, refuses to sleep with his wife. He literally sleeps outside of his own home. He's not going to go in because, again, he's not going to dishonor his wife. He's not going to dishonor his men. And we see, yet again, David's plan fail. So a third time, we see David scheme. And in an act of complete and total desperation, we see in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 14. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab. Again, this is that captain of his army. And he sent it by the hand of Uriah. And in the letter, he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him that he may be struck down and what? Die. This is his plan. To have the man ultimately murdered who he is guilty of cheating on his wife with and impregnating. Interesting too that David sends Uriah into battle with a letter that is ultimately going to seal his fate and lead to his untimely death. David's plan, ultimately, if you know the story, it works. Uriah is killed, and as you look at this, in this moment, you think, okay, crisis averted. David's good. He's, he's fine. And while he does save his political career, and he rescues his public reputation, if you continue reading in 2 Samuel at how David's life goes, we begin to see that his relationships with his family, it's never the same. It continues to descend. We see that David's credibility with his family is completely undermined, and he is ultimately at odds with his kids. We see that his family tree is filled with betrayal and rape and murder. That child, by the way, that he conceived with Bathsheba eventually dies and gets sick. His favorite son is killed in war with his own father. This outcome that David so desperately tries to coerce and contrive and happen, it's all coming undone. And just when it seems like it's all going to be over for David, and we wouldn't be talking about him right here and right now, God sends a prophet to David. The prophet's name is Nathan. This man is clearly wiser than David. He pulls him out of his isolation, and there's, there's something that's really important that I think we need to catch here, and, and it's this, is that Nathan actually knew David. David knew Nathan. Nathan had access to him. I was thinking about that relationship, and I was thinking about me, and like wondering, like, who has access to me? Who has access to you? Who, who really knows you? And not, not the version of us that we, you know, like to share and when someone asks, how you doing? And then, or maybe that next version of like, here's where we're spending our time. But like the, like the stuff that maybe you only share with one or two people. When you're struggling, like really struggling. Or when you're so filled with joy that it's, it's brimming at the top and you run to this one 
person? Do you have someone who has access to you? Do you have someone who can say something to you no matter what it is and you probably won't punch them? <laughs> probably. Do you have someone that you have in your life that you can speak truth and love and say that thing that needs to be said that you know they'll be able to receive? Now, thankfully, David did, and his name was Nathan. And Nathan is an uh, incredibly wise man because as he presents this truth that David needs to hear, he does so in a way that doesn't get him killed. Because back then, if you messed with a king and he was mad at you, you, you could just, you know, all of those, you, know, you could just kill him and things were fine. And so what he does is he, present, he begins to present what looks like a court case to this king. And he's saying, hey, I need, king, I need your wisdom on this, David, and tell me how you would rule as a king. And so this is how that Go, 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting out in verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. I love that too, by the way. God sending someone to someone. It's good. How many times has he sent someone to us when we needed someone? He could have just spoken directly to David, but he sent someone to someone. That's how he operates. He came to him and he said to him, and there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. And the rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and he grew it with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. And it was like a daughter to him. Some of you treat your dogs and your cats like this, like a human, like a human being sleeping in the same bed. You spoon. It's cute. It's great. Just like this. Imagine this scenario, okay? Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb, and he prepared it for the man who had come to him. So we see the traps been set. And listen to how David responds. Verse 5. And then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He takes the bait. Hook, line, and sinker. And then we see down in verse 7. And Nathan you see, you hear the violins, you know, it's coming, the crescendo. You are that man. Busted. And Nathan boldly asks King David, verse 9, here comes the truth, here comes the love. Now, why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? And with no... Where to hide now, no time for excuses, no alternative plans that he can scheme. He's looking at Nathan right here. He says in verse 13, And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. See, David had isolated himself. He'd surround himself with fools, and we know what that leads to. He didn't have anyone who was speaking into his life to encourage him to say, Oh, don't go down that path. That's not good. That's going to lead to death. And we saw eventually what he became when that happened. But when he began to experience community, because we were created for community, the kind of community, the kind of family that God has given us to make us more like Jesus, to help encourage us and to walk with us, we see he begins to turn around. And now we're talking about, I believe, David because of Nathan, because of that friendship because of the courage that he had and because the humility that David modeled when he finally said, I've blown it. I've blown it. We become who we surround ourselves with and we're all becoming someone. Proverbs 13, 20, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Who are you becoming? I bet if you looked around at the people that you're surrounded with, that will give you a pretty good idea of who you're becoming. I bet if you have no one around you, that will also give you an idea of who you are becoming. 
And I wonder if David, there was a moment in time when he had the opportunity much earlier before he had kind of made a mess of things, when he could have reached out, when he could have responded. He said, yeah, there's a better way. I see that I'm isolated. I see that I'm alone. I see that uh, my judgment, as Proverbs 18 says, is waning. I need someone in my life that really knows me. But here's the good news is that God created us to do life together, not just to avoid making big mistakes, but, but, but truly, life is at its best when we have people in our world who really know us, right? Right? I bet you've got memories and experiences where you would say that my top five times in my life, you probably have somebody next to you, somebody with you. A group of guys uh, yesterday went whitewater rafting. Do I have any of those men that were there yesterday? None, none. Okay, one, one. Okay, two. There we go. We have a few men, and some of us almost died together on a raft that got flipped over. David is right there, and by the grace of God, he's still alive with us today. Woo! Yeah, it's a miracle. He's not dead, and we aren't either. He, like, hulked the boat as we are under the water. Water is crashing over us, crashing over the boat, and Dave just kind of comes up with the boat and saves all of our lives. And truly, I realize life is better together because death really would have been the alternative to that if it weren't. But as I look back at some of the pictures that we got, it's like, man, the look on our faces, priceless. These experiences that we get to have, oh, it's the good stuff. It's the good stuff. I think that's why the enemy is so persistent in trying to pull us away and to keep us from community and these relationships because he knows that this is, this is God's methodology to shape us and to invite us into the men and the women that he longs for us to be and the people we want most to be two. So where do we go from here? What do we do with all this? You may be familiar with Brene Brown. She's a psychologist who has done a lot of work on relationships and shame. And in talking about community, she had these three different categories of where we all are going to fall when we think about where we are today when it comes to having and being in community with other people. And here's the reality. We all have been all three of these. So it's not like, oh, you're, you know, and you're always and you're never. It's that we are all of these. But here's my question, and I want you to begin to think about where you are this morning. The first category that she talks about is to move away. And this category was when, you know, something's happened, and so we recoil or we retract from people. This is what happens sometimes relationally when things get hard, and so you're like, I'm out, I'm done. Um, I'll confess that sometimes when my wife is sharing some things and she's starting to get emotional and she's sharing those emotions and I'm like, I don't really know what to do with that, those emotions. And so instead of leaning in, sometimes I'm just like, just, you know, and she's, I could see it. She's like, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going to not here because uh, I can't figure that out, all of this. And, you know, and I, men, are you with me? Any man in the house? That's like, okay, you're just going to let me be out here all by myself. <laughs> Forget you then, all right? <laughs> so that's some of us when things get messy or they get snotty or they get squishy. And honestly, this is the easy and socially acceptable path. And we use words in America like, oh, autonomous, and oh, he's a self-starter, and he's, you know, man, independent, and we're good with this. And a lot of us fall in this category, and maybe this is where you are today. Brown talks about a second category, though, of people a little bit more aggressive, and it's to move against relationship, to move against community. This is when you might have a perspective, or maybe you know someone in your life who's like this, where it's like, trust no one. They're out to get me, and I know it. What do you want? What do you, you know, you, you come to the door, knock on the door, and they're like, mm, yeah, you know, you're probably going to try to murder me. Who are, you know, maybe we're all like that now, but this is, this is someone who maybe you've been hurt, or maybe you feel like you have nothing to offer, and so what you've done is you've, you've put a wall up. And we can even do this with our closest friends and even our spouses. And you may not see that wall and someone else may not see that wall, but you know what? The people around you feel it. They feel like they're on the other side of a wall. 
you feel like you're on the inside of a wall, isolated, and alone, vulnerable. Brown talks about a third category, and it's, it's the most difficult category, I'll tell you right now, it's the hardest. But as is almost always the case, it's the most rewarding. And this is to move toward. This is a little discombobulating. It's honest. It's vulnerable. It takes time and sacrifice and risk. Things are going to get messy sometimes, but you press in instead of running away. And so when you think about these, move away, move against, move toward. Where do you find yourself This morning, in this season, you know, if I'm honest, uh, in my broken nature, I gravitate most closely to move away, which is interesting, given my personality and given the fact that I'm in ministry and you think, oh, no, he's got to do it right. He's a pastor and uh, I've copied my wife and she'll tell you, there's a whole, you know, I'm human and I'm broken. and, And what I find about me is I'm getting to know me a little bit better and I'm I'm getting a little older and I'm, I'm starting to understand my brokenness even more, I think. And what I've done is I have distracted the people from really getting to know the real me. And I can do that in, in the name of ministry. And I'm like, how are you? And what's going on with you? And, you know, and tell me your heart. And, yeah, you know, and, and if they ever flip it, I'm like, no, let's just keep staying. Let's keep the spotlight on you, you know, because I don't really know where I am. Or maybe I do and I don't have the courage or want to be vulnerable enough to share what's really going on. Do you ever feel like you can be around people a whole lot, but yet there's like this whole other level of who you are that they don't know and maybe sometimes you don't know that maybe you're struggling sometimes? You're hurting. You feel lonely. You have these longings or hopes or dreams, but you're afraid to express it because I don't know. What if I'm wrong? It might sound silly. This is, this is where I can be, and I'm thankful that by the grace of God, I don't stay there for very long, though I can drift back there, and we all can drift. In fact, I have a few people, even with my title, that, that are in this church who uh, know me, really know me, and I could say just about anything to them. And they'll love me, and they'll speak truth. There's something divine and mysterious when we have those kinds of friendships. And let me tell you, they don't happen accidentally. And they don't happen quickly. But it's the good stuff. And as we think about the fall, as we transition, as we think about what it means to do life together, it begins with that word together. It's family. I know that we're all in all different kinds of places. And so here's what I want to say. I want to encourage you to do this, to move towards. Because the only way that you and I can be deeply encouraged is if we are fully known. And that's on us. It's really easy to say, well, they don't ask good questions and no one pursued me or invited me to their dinner ever. Right? It's on us to open up. be a little bit vulnerable in longings to pursue relationship, whatever that looks like for you. So here's what moving toward might look like for you. For you, it may look like coming just a little early, <laughs> sipping a little bit of coffee with somebody and exchanging names just as that first that first dipping your toe in is moving. Staying a little bit late and interacting and mingling. You, somebody hugged you uh, this morning that you probably didn't know. And I'm sorry for that, <laughs> but, but we care more about community than comfort. And God does too. For you, it may look like, hey, there's, there's these teams doing things. And I don't know if I'm ready to sit in a circle in a living room, but you know what? Like maybe I can help out with, you know, the kids or that teardown team or the set, or maybe I can, you know, maybe I can get to know some people that are on the tech team or worship team. And maybe that's your step where God's saying, hey, what, why, don't you, why don't you jump in? And you can rub shoulder to shoulder with a few people and start to see what God might begin to spark going to be talking more and more about groups in the coming weeks. This may be your time. You may have never been in a small group. You may have once been in a small group. You may right now be in a small group that you didn't stop meeting at because you so love 
community and hunger for it. But wherever you are, maybe this is your chance to jump in. And, and when you have the opportunity to write it on a bulletin or to go see what's available, maybe God's nudging you, tapping you and saying, hey, now's the time. Now's the time. There's going to be opposition. There's going to be risk. There's going to be cost. 